Hi, I'm Dan, and if you're new to homebrewing, so am I. Welcome to my adventures in homebrewing. Hey everybody, it's Dan, and it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, listen to me rant one more time. Uh, I greatly appreciate it, and uh, I'm sorry I haven't been around for the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, things have been kind of crazy here at the house. Uh, we had some family matters we needed to take care of, and uh, my family always comes first. So uh, thanks for being patient with me. Uh, I know I haven't been that active, and I do apologize. But... With that said, let's get down to business. And, but first, uh, let's have a uh, quick message from our sponsor. It's Dan here one more time, and I'm happy to say that we are now, or should I say my podcast, is now sponsored by Escarpment Laboratories. Yeast production for the fermentation of the exceptional craft beer. Whether your kit is on the stovetop or in a commercial brew house, wholesale yeast and quality control for the profitable bro pro brewer community engagement and education for the discerning home brewery. If you are a craft brewer and you love using quality yeast, then you really do need to check out Escarbon Laboratories. Dan here one more time to say thank you to the great people over at Brewer's Friend for the fantastic offer they have just given us. For all the new users of Brewer's Friend for their first year, you're going to receive 15% off. That's 50% savings on this great piece of software. And what is Brewer's Friend? Well, Brewer's Friend is a complete recipe designer, brew day planner, and journal. The details make the difference between an average batch of homebrew and a truly ex excellent brew that is repeatable. Brewer's Friend automates the details, guides you through the brewing process, and saves all the data. And how do you get all this fun stuff? Well, once you go in and you sign in and you go to sign up for Brewer's Friend and to get that 15% savings, you need to use the promo code PODCAST. That's all you got to do. When you sign up, Type in podcast for the promo code and you will get 15% off. Again, thank you to the great people at Brewer's Friend for this, and I'll see you on the other side. So uh, we're back, and uh, I'm going to pick up where uh, I kind of left off, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago when I put out a social media posting saying I was going to tell you guys about how I got into, uh, whoop, there, how I got into making beer and uh, also, um, uh, what you need to actually uh, get going with this. Uh, but before we do, uh, uh, thanks for listening to the episode I put up uh, previous to this. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I am going to be trying to get some more folks on the show to talk about some cool and interesting stuff. Um, but until then, uh, I am going to be, uh, be the one rambling away. So uh, thanks for putting up with my bad jokes and everything else. So without further ado, um, so... Uh, when I got into homebrewing, and this is gonna, I'm gonna date myself here. Uh, I got into homebrewing basically in in around two thousand, yeah, around the year two thousand. Uh, my wife had gone out to our local U brew store. I don't think U brew stores are around anymore. Um, went to our local U brew store, uh, bought me a, a basic homebrew kit, which consisted of a plastic carboy, a uh, plastic bucket. And the airlock. I don't think it had a lot airlock. No, if I'm right, it didn't have an airlock. Uh, it had a spoon, floating thermometer, uh, float. Uh, it also had the hydrometer. Uh, it had uh, the uh, powdered sanitizer. It had dextrose to make for priming sugar. Uh, you name it, it had it. The only thing it didn't have was a lid and also a airlock. That I do remember. So. That's all I came with the kit. And she also bought me the, uh, the one of the Cooper's cans of uh, LME. And uh, it, that comes with the, your yeast and your hops and everything else. So I went and did that. Uh, my first kick of the cat, uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to follow the directions this as good as I could. Um, but, but, you know, following directions doesn't always go as as planned. So, but you do, you do try. Um, so I really didn't understand how much water I was going to need. I didn't know, understand how big a pot I was going to need. It turned out I needed like two or three pots to make this work, uh, which was holy moly, 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 moly. Cause I didn't realize he had to boil this stuff. Yeah, but how I do. Um, 
And I kept hearing from my wife, oh my God, this stinks, this stinks, this stinks. I'm like, mm, I can understand that. I mean, I like the smell of Brute. I like the smell of making beer. My wife doesn't. And that's totally fine. So come forward. Uh, it's all, it's all uh, fermented out. I put it into the uh, plastic bucket for the fermenter, but I have to cool it down before I pitch the yeast. So I'm there and I'm packing it with this, the kitchen sink with ice, with with water to try and drop the temperature as fast as I could. Oh, it, it was hard. I uh, finally got it down, pitched it, and I went looking for the lid. There was no lid. Uh, like, okay, uh, well, I can figure something out. I found a lid, I had it, and I put a hole in it for an airlock, and there was no airlock. So, and I'm pretty sure I've told this story more than once. Uh, so, I went, and what I did was I got some saran wrap and all that saran wrapped over the top of the, uh, the bucket. And then I bungee corded it to keep it where it needed to be. And uh, let's just say that that beer did not turn out that great. <laughs> so I tried a couple more times going that way, then I gave up. Um, come forward a few years, I mean, I, I still loved craft beer. Uh, I always have, always will. And uh, coming forward, uh, I've, I've done my time in the military. Uh, I've been a huge craft beer geek for a, a long time and whenever i would get a chance to go to a craft brewery whatever else i would ask to see the back i would ask how they do it i was like i love learning this stuff so in 2017 after i had been out of the military for a while um i met my boss is now justin mcneil and mark plant uh the owners of uh, straight hog brewing company and uh, I met them at a craft sale. My wife was uh, had a little table lot selling some stuff. And uh, one thing led to another. And I wound up uh, working for them. And honestly, it's, it was one of the best things I could have ever done. Because their being there actually inspired me to get back into making beer. But not doing it the way I previously would. But doing it the way we would at the brewery by using all grain, uh, you know, hop, the hops that you can go and you buy, you can select, not someone selecting them for you. And you get to choose the yeast that you want to use. Doing that, uh, it was absolutely one of the best things I could have done, which led me into going down the rabbit hole into what I have right now in my garage uh, for, for everything. Um, so yeah, it, it was a bit of a, bit of a, a crazy time. Um, but now uh, things have changed so much in the homebrew world. Uh, to be perfectly honest, you really don't need a whole lot to get into it. Um, yes, the, the, the LME cans and DME and all that other fun stuff is still out there. And it's still used widely. Uh, and don't get me wrong, if you're if done right, they make fantastic beer. Or they're great for helping you get uh, yeast starters going and things like that. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're, they're great products. Um, I just like doing it the way I've seen it. I understand it. And I can control it a lot better. So now, now you've heard the story about, again, multiple times, of how I got into making beer. Let's talk about things that you're going to need to get into making beer if you want to do it however way you want. So. Like I said before, all you really need to really get started is a pot, a bucket, and your ingredients. That's it. Uh, you need a pot or a big kind of a boil kettle or stock pot that's big enough to hold enough water for all of uh, your liquid and also for your malt for what you're going to do. You got to be able to boil it and go from there. You got to be able to chill it. So doing it on a stovetop basically either you use your sink with ice and also cold water or excuse me or you have a an actual wart chiller that you actually put down to the kettle and you run cold water through it and do it that way uh the actual kits like that are usually about 125 bucks i believe because it comes with a fair amount of stuff it, it comes with not only the carboy the bucket the airlock the lid uh, i believe a mash paddle a hydrometer the test tube uh the airlock uh and a couple other things depending on who's who's selling the kit 
that is a basic setup. That's all you need. You just need to keep the stuff in a, in a nice warm area if you're, once you get into it, because you can't do loggers just yet, because loggers take a little bit more to it. So if you're doing an ale, all you got to do is put it in a warm, uh, stable environment uh, in your house and, and go from there. And then when it comes time to, to, to package it, you get your bottles and a siphon and a hose and away you go. And yeah, and then I, I forgot to mention, if you're going to do it with a bucket or a cardboard, you are going to need an auto siphon and a bottling wand. Those actually go a long way to help you out in the long run. Okay. Now, if uh, you're going to be going down the road a little bit more, there are some cool toys that you can get uh, to help you out. Uh, if you're going to go in the, the world of all grain brewing like I have, there are some things that you really do need to consider. Are you going to be doing an all-in-one system? Are you going to do it a three-tier uh, electric system, a three-tier uh, gas system? Uh, are you going to need a glycol chiller? Are you going to use stainless steel? Or are you going to steal with uh, glass or plastic carboys or buckets? Uh, are you going to do special ingredients and things like that? that or are you going to buy it in bulk? So there's a lot out there that you really do need to understand. Um, whoever says, yeah, getting into making beer at home, you're going to save so much money in the long run. It's, it's relative. I mean, I can honestly say uh, I have not saved money. I enjoy my hobby. I don't mind spending the money on my hobby, uh, but uh, it does get expensive. Uh, especially when you look at getting into some of the newer gear that's out there. Uh, so what I have uh, for my gear, and I'll explain everything that I have and why I have it, it goes a long way into making your life a little easier. Uh, I have an all-in-one electric system made by Keglen called Bruzula because I killed my robo brew. I don't know how. Uh, I'm assuming it's because there wasn't enough airflow underneath and the circuit board overheated and fried. So I, I went and I tried to replace the boards and everything else. It didn't work. Uh, then what I did was I went and just bought a whole brand new Bruzilla, which is working fantastic. I think they've solved the problem of the uh, of, of not enough air circulation getting in underneath because they put feet on it, get it up, let air go underneath. And there's some new handles and a few other things here. It's working really well. And those usually run them between four and five hundred dollars, depending on which one you get. Uh, you can get uh, the larger version uh, of the Bruzilla, uh, the sixty-five liter one, uh, which is a two forty volt, and they actually do work faster, just because it's pulling more power. Now, that is one way. But for all-in-one systems, there's a lot out there. There's Blickman, there's Anvil, there's Spike. I, don't, I like Spike. I really, really do. Um, and I, I'm hoping they're listening to this. And if they can, guys, if you ever got something you want to send this way for me to test, uh, please let me know. Uh, I could happily test it out for you. Um, and uh, yeah, the all-in-one systems are, in my opinion, uh, if you're just getting into it, are a great way to start. Now, or you can go with a three-vessel system. Uh, you can get these as either gas or electric. Uh, you can get a Herms heat exchange uh, recycling mash uh, or RIMS. Uh, uh, was it Rev RIMS? I can't remember. Half these names I can't remember. Um, so recir recirculating infusion mash system, I believe it is. I believe that's what it is. Uh, so you can get those. Um, Herms seems to be the more popular version. Uh, you, with a three vessel system, you get one is that as your, uh, hot liquor tank, you get a mash ton and you get a boil kettle. That's that. Those who, that whole system there, if you're getting it as an electric system can, depending on your size, can run you almost over $2,000 or more. So it all depends on what you want to do. Um, eventually, uh, like like me, you want to level up a little bit and be able to make more and have more to share with your friends and everything else. So yeah, so for me, I, I'd like to uh, just because I have a tendency to get into a lot of competitions and also share a lot of my beer or I have people wanting me to make beer for them and I'm making the beer. I'm like, well, I'd like to have some of this for myself, for my kegerator. So I find myself not having to do two brew days in, 
for the same beer instead of just being able to make one large batch and divide it over two vessels. So that's me. So with that, um, that's your basic setup. You could, believe it or not, use coolers, and they are out there. I just don't understand how they work, so I can't really talk to them. Now, you're go once the beer is done, you're going to need a way to chill it down. I want you to see when the wort is done boiling. So you're going to need a, a wort chiller. So there's a couple of versions of a wort chillers you can get. You can get just straight up copper, which works great. Uh, the Bruzilla comes from one with that stainless steel. Uh, you can get heat exchangers, or you can get a, uh, was it a uh, or, um, counter flow chiller that you can get, which are fairly expensive. Um, those are great. Uh, I stayed with the one that came with uh, my, my Bruzilla, which is stainless steel. It works, works fine. Uh, it gets it down to ale temperatures pretty quick. Uh, but before you can actually pitch the yeast, sometimes the yeast or your recipe requires the actual wort to be down to a certain temperature. So you got to let it sit for a few minutes. And if it's during the summer, well, you're going to get make sure you get that down cold as fast as you can and keep it somewhere cool to get it down. Um, or you have what I have, which is a glycol chiller, and you use that to help break it down. Now, you are going to need some things to help you um, measure out stuff and things like that. So you're going to need a scale. Uh, I suggest you get a nice postal scale. That's what I have because you can do ounces, grams, kilograms, pounds. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic piece of kit. And that's also good to have when you come, to, come down to weighing out your grain. Uh, it's also good for when you need to weigh out how much, uh, how many hops that you need, because you just can't dump an ounce in and a shot. Sometimes it's like a half an ounce, a third of an ounce, a whole ounce, two ounces. It all depends on what you're making. And that, and a, a good scale like what I have, could be about a hundred bucks or more. Um, I like the postal scales because they're pretty accurate, and you can get them on Amazon from anywhere from a hundred to five hundred dollars. So do your research, have a look and go from there. Uh, you're gonna need uh, hydrometers. Uh, usually one will come with uh, your kit. It, you'll fill up your test tube, drop your, uh, your hydrometer in and you'll look to see where it's at. Those can run you anywhere between, between 20 and 30 bucks. Unless you're a gadget geek like me and you go out and spend money on a little system called a tilt hydrometer. Now these can be $125 or more because they're, they're obviously electronic. They're a floating uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, uh, thermometer and hydrometer all in one. I use these a lot so I can monitor uh, what the progress of my beer is. And once I get it to the point where I want it, I'm able to stop ferment fermentation by cold crashing uh, the actual beer itself and getting it to where it needs to be. Now, hydrometers are one thing and they're great. Gadgets are fantastic, but there's still some more things that you need to have. There are things you need to, for to balance your pH. There are things you need to add for the healthy beer for the yeast. There are things you need to add uh, to clarify your beer. There are things you need to add to keep it from boiling over other than just washing it. So, this is done by a company called Five Star. Now, Five Star is a, uh, a great company that I like to use for a lot of my stuff. Uh, they have a, a pH stabilizer, which uh, I've used now a few times and it's worked fantastic. Uh, I have their Super Moss, which I use during uh, the boil for when it comes down time to clarify my beer before I actually move it into uh, an actual fermenter. I have a defoamer, which I put only one or two drops in uh, at the beginning to keep any, anything, all the proteins, everything else that what happens that can come up and boil over, that stops it. It's fantastic. Uh, now, there's also yeast nutrients. Now, I don't think uh, Five Star does this, but I do know my uh, sponsor, uh, Escarpment Laboratories have a great product called Yeast Lightning, and they're, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic stuff. So check that out. Um, there's all that, but 
those aren't really that expensive. Uh, you know, you're looking at me, depending on how much you buy is 20 or 30 bucks. Now, up to me, when you're making beer, the most expensive stuff that you're going to want to put your money into, other than some, some decent equipment for a one time go and you're going to drop the money on it. That's great. But you also need ingredients. Now, there are a lot of things out there that you can go and buy. There's adjuncts, there's malts, uh, not malts, there's liquid malt, there's dry malt. Uh, there's actually the grains you can go and buy. Uh, I use grain. So for me, I buy my grain, depending on what it is, like base malts, I buy, I buy that in bulk. So uh, what I do is I have these uh, containers called Vittle Vaults. You can get them at PetSmart. Uh, they're moisture, air, and critter proof, which is great because my grain is out in my garage and every now and then I do find the odd mouse scurrying around, which for some reason, I don't know how they even get inside the garage thing is it's all sealed up. Go figure, right? So there's that. Uh, those Vittle vaults are anywhere from 50 to $70 and they'll hold one of those containers will hold one full sack of grain, which is fantastic. So from there, then you got to look at things and those sacks of grain uh, can be anywhere from 55 to $85, depending on the grain that you want. Uh, a lot of us have a tendency to go towards three main base malts, at least uh, I do anyway, uh, Pilsner, Two Row and Marisotter. Those are my, my go-to base malts a lot of the time. And I use a lot of the, like when I did my Baltic Porter, uh, my base malt for, uh, for it was almost, almost the majority of, of the build. So it took almost 10 to 12 pounds worth of base malt and everything else was like little, little bits here and there. So it was pretty, pretty intense. And base malt, base malts are, in my opinion, the cheaper thing to buy. If you're looking at your special grains, that's when you got to be a little bit more careful and you got to make sure you buy the right ones in and whatnot and base malt on oh the base malts but especially malts can range anywhere depending on on how much that you're buying if you're buying like a small like 200 gram bag it may spend five bucks if you're going for almost a four or five pound bag that's already pre-measured and everything else for you you're going to pay maybe 20 or 20 to 40 dollars depending on what it is so you got to weigh out exactly what it is you want how you're going to store it and everything else. I do suggest that if you're going to buy uh, malts and they have them left over, uh, get air, airtight, watertight containers to put them in and go from there. Now, once all this is organized and going, you still need a couple of things to actually get things going properly. So you do need vessels to ferment, and you need some way to actually crush uh, your actual grain. So there are options out there. So if you're getting into it and you're looking at getting your own mill, uh, look at getting a mill. They can be anywhere from, I think, $100 to $200. Uh, you can get them where they're a hand crank or you can get in a little motor attached. You put it to a drill and you go from there. You have to measure the gap on this mainly because uh, if it's too big, it's not going to do anything. If it's too small, you're going to make flour. So basically, the I guess the rule of thumb is uh, when you're measuring the gap of the rollers inside of your uh, your mill, you don't want any more than maybe a credit card width. So what I'll do is I'll take an old card that I don't use anymore. Uh, I'll put it down there. I'll measure the gap each time to make sure it's right and the card is, fits nicely. And then... Once it's all locked down and I'm ready to mill, I'll take a handful of grain, put that in, and I'll slowly start to turn the actual axle of the, of the grain to actually have that stuff engage and make sure it's milling properly before I dump everything else in, hook up the drill and go from there. It makes my life easy. Now, on the actual cold side, so we've been talking a lot about the hot side, hot side is like your, your kettles and everything else on the cold side. Now that's going to be your fermenters and everything else that you've attached to that. So for me, my cold side, I have three fermenters. Uh, I have a bright tank and I also have a glycol chiller. Now, if you're just getting into it, like I said, you have these kits where they come with a carboy and a plastic bucket and that's all you really need to start. 
then you start looking at, well, maybe I want to try and maybe collect yeast at the end. I want to do some dry hopping. I want to do this. I want to do that. Okay. So now you got to look at a, maybe a, a new piece of equipment. A great piece of equipment to actually get into and start with is, believe it or not, a plastic fermenter. And I have two of these by a company called Kegland, and they're called Firmzillas. And they are absolutely fantastic because not only can you attach cooling coils to it, which I have, but you can also just use it as a regular kind of like fermenter with an airlock, or you can pressure ferment with it with a spunding valve. And I've done all of this and they work fantastic. They're rated to 35 PSI for about two years. And after that, you have to do a constant test to make sure there's no leaks, there's no cracks, whatever. Go from there. Um, these uh, as an entry level conical fermenter are absolutely fantastic. And I highly recommend them. Uh, and, and go from there, guys, honestly, it's, it's, they're, they're well worth the investment. Now, I wanted something else to, to help me out with my fermenters. I didn't want to get another piece of plastic because I was, I was debating whether or not I should, but I felt like I wanted to level up my game again. So I went and bought, excuse me, I went and bought uh, a uh, Spike Flex Plus fermenter, which is also pressure fermentation rated up to 15 PSI, which is a fantastic because you don't really need to get any higher than that when it comes down to it. So with this fermenter, not only does it have a dump valve, it has a port for a blow off. Uh, the new lids, you can have a port for dry hopping and a, part, a port uh, on the top for uh, a spunding valve. And then you have the actual main port where you put your cooling coil if you're, if you're using a, um, a glycol chiller. And they're great. And with everything I got with it, it's, it was close to eight or $900. So you're investing in a piece of equipment that's going to last you a lifetime. So you know, when it comes to getting into stainless steel, you really do need to weigh, are you going to be staying with this hobby or are you going to be going down the rabbit hole like I have with this hobby? So you really got to weigh out what you want to do. Um, one piece of kit that I wanted and I saw like for what I was doing, it was going to be needed, especially seeing as I was keeping my stuff uh, outside during the summer. It was a huge investment and it cost me $1,500. That's with the shipping from the States. It's a uh, four vessel uh, glycol chiller that I got from a company called um, Brewbuilt. So everything I got with this uh, system, uh, it, all the pumps, all the temperature uh, controls, everything else is all internalized to this one unit. I can run four vessels. I can cool, I should say, four vessels off of it. Each vessel gets its own temperature probe. And with the use of this system, it has saved my beer more than once. It's been fantastic. Now, what I used to do is I used to bottle condition everything. I used to get the Cooper's Carb Drops, which I love and still use them when I do sour beer because I'm not putting any of that inside of my regular system because once it's in there, it's contaminated. Um, I use the Carb Drops and, and they're, they're fantastic. But I have something now that I use uh, which is a bright tank. And this is a great piece of kit. I have a 10 gallon bright tank. You can move all your beer, uh, be it, let's see, like five, maximum 10, obviously, uh, into this vessel. And you comes with a carb stone and everything else. And you can carbonate in cold crash in this vessel. And then you can either move it to a keg or you can actually um, bottle out of it, which is what I'm going to be doing later today because I have a nice Baltic porter I need to, to bottle. So, that is, is a lot of stuff that is going on. Um, I am looking at maybe getting a can steamer or a new mill, uh, mainly because I'm looking to try and make my life a little easier. So yeah, that is pretty much everything that you need to get into uh, home brewing and what happens when you go down the rabbit hole. So I hope you enjoyed this, this episode. I, I'm Again, I'm really sorry uh, about... Uh, what's happened uh with over the last two weeks and uh stay tuned because i think the next the next uh, show may be uh me talking about what i'm gonna be doing to my garage to make it a little bit more like my own brewery so thanks a lot for coming out for a ride and a beer or two along the way guys i'm dan and i'll see you on the other side <laughs>
And as you can see, I'm drinking my coffee. It's morning. Coffee's needed. But you know where another good place to put coffee is, especially when it's espresso in beer. But that's neither here nor there. So we are going to be moving on to what we're actually talking about this week. We're going to be talking about all things Baltic Porter. So Baltic Porters come out from the Baltic area of, uh, of Europe. So you're looking at Lithuania, you're looking at Estonia, uh, I believe Finland's in there, Germany is in along there, uh, parts of Russia, uh, I think Sweden too. There's a few other places. I'm going to put up a map probably um, when I go into post this up on uh, on Facebook and all that about uh, where this is beers from. Um, it is. It came out roughly around 1722. I'm going to see if I can remember the name of the gentleman who is responsible for putting it out. Uh, it, well, I think it was James Harwood from the Shore Ditch Brewery in around 1722. There's been a few things that have said that uh, this beer didn't really exist or whatever else. It was created mainly to fill a void uh, for this for for people who were the working class that wanted a nice beer so this beer was pro, pro predominantly uh drank by uh porters so they're like street porters or river porters so these are the people that would actually take your luggage luggage place on the boat follow you around make sure it's getting from point a to point b kind of like um a, you know a Sherpa that you would see in Nepal uh, when you're climbing Everest, the guys that carry all your heavy shit. So these are the guys that would make sure your heavy shit would get to uh, your carriage, your boat, your hotel room, you name it. These are the people that would, that this beer was appealing to. Now, porters are, are very similar to stouts. Difference being is, is that while, while they still have predominantly the same grain bill, uh, usually the alcohol content is a lot different uh, with stouts you're looking at between four and 4.5 maximum five percent for a normal stout uh, for the alcohol content and when you're looking at porters you're looking at something at a, in around uh, say like between five up to maybe six percent just for a standard porter which is a huge difference when you're looking at what uh, the alcohol content is but it, it's always been a very similar thing. Both of these beers have, like stouts and porters, have similar origins and where they come from. Now, we're looking at things like, oh my goodness, what we got to see here? Uh, I'll read a little bit of history. How's that? So a little bit of history is a porter is a style of beer that was developed in London, England in the early 18th century. It was a well-hopped and dark in appearance owing to the use of brown malts. Well, yeah, brown malts, chocolate malts, black malts, and things like that will give you that nice, dark, black characteristic. But it'll also give you that really nice, deep, rich, roasted barley, roasted coffee, even sometimes the, that really nice, dark chocolate flavor that you, what we're all looking for. The name originated from its popularity with street and reporters, kind of like I said. Now, the popularity of Porter was significant, and it became the first beer style to be brewed across the world and production had commenced in Ireland, North America, Sweden, and Russia by the end of the 18th century. Now, the history of stout and porter are intertwined. The name stout used for a dark beer came about because strong porters were marked as stout porter. Later was shortened to just stout. Guinness Extra Stout was originally called Extra Superior Porter and was not given the name Extra Stout until 1840. Today, the terms are used by different breweries almost interchangeably to describe dark beers, and the two styles have more in common than in distinction. It's kind of like we were talking about. Both these beers come from around the same time period, most definitely uh, the same kind of characteristics in what you use for grain and what you use for yeast and what you use for hops now one of the big differences like i said is the alcohol content but now we're going to talk about something that i really do enjoy 
but it's a beer that I normally have to share with people just due to the fact that it's such a high alcohol content. It's usually about a 10% beer, and I usually have to share it with people because sitting down and drinking a bottle of this by myself is a, it's quite the undertaking because that's a beer that it's usually your one and done, especially when those beers come in large bomber bottles. Well, it's a bomber bottle, you're looking at something that's like 750 milliliters to a liter. So those beers are the ones that I have to be very careful with. And that's me though. So now a Baltic Porter is a version of an Imperial Stout. And what's, what does that mean? So I'll read a little bit more history here. Uh, Baltic Porter is a version of Imperial Stout that originated in the Baltic region in the 19th century. Imperial stouts exported from Britain in the 18th century were popular in countries around the Baltic Sea and were cre recreated uh, locally using local ingredients and brewing traditions. So in around that area, like I was saying, all those different places have different ways to make sure that beer meets their, their requirements, their characteristics, and what they use also dictates how the, the flavors are going to be. Now, all those different Baltic states all have different, I guess, brewing styles. Like if you look at Germany, uh, they have the Rhein Heskobolt, so it has the German purity laws for beer. Uh, then you go into Sweden, you go into Russia, whatever else. Everyone has different ingredients and different styles, and they all impart different flavor characteristics or notes in on what this beer is. Now, uh, in early days, up until, mm, let's see, what, else, what are we going to say here? So early versions were warm fermented until the late 19th century. Okay, yeah. So everything, what they're saying is, is basically everything that these beers were, just because of the fact that there wasn't temperature control at the time, were all top fermented beers. And we all would know what that means. So you're looking at beer that's being fermented between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's a top fermenting yeast working its way down. Okay, we get it. But from what I've been reading is that now the Baltic Porter has evolved into something a little different. Yes, it still falls into uh, a porter, but after the Second World War, um, they found ways to actually make this beer, but using lager yeast. So it basically is falling into the lager category. So it's falling into things like a Schwartz beer and also uh, a Dunkel and things like that. But you're also looking at a gravity at around 10 per or an alcohol content of a 10% or higher. That's due to the fact when the grain bill and you're looking when you make one of these, you're looking at it almost a 25 pound grain bill. So you're looking at a lot of Marisada or Turo, you're looking at Crystal and Dark Munich, you're looking at some, maybe some Vienna, then you're looking at things for color, you're looking at maybe black malt, chocolate malt, roasted barley, things that are impart that nice dark rich flavor. But you also need those malts that are also going to convert their sugars into the alcohol content that you're, that's required. So you're looking at maybe the high sugar grains so you're looking at maybe a lot of base malt you're looking at a lot of things that are, have sugars like crystal malts those are the ones that are going to have a really nice sweet flavors lots of sugars to to give to make this beer so I will put up uh, in the description what a lot of these countries are, and maybe I'll try and find out a little bit more about their brewing styles about this beer. But what I can say is that, um, where are we? Ah. So yeah, that's okay, we'll move on. We'll edit this part out. But um, Baltic porters are basically, um, one of those unique unicorn beers that when someone finds a way to make it, you make it really, really well. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I first had my first Baltic Porter, uh, I wasn't too sure about it. I was, wasn't was really sure uh, if it was going to be one of those things that I really, really wanted. And then I was like, yeah, it is one of those things that I really do like and I really do want. So I got, I delve, I dove headfirst into making this beer. So now what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be making my very first Baltic Porter. So I've got a roughly about a 20 pound grain pill. So five pounds less than what I think is normal 
but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, so I've got my mirror solder. I've got crystal, uh, uh, light crystal, dark crystal, light Munich, dark Munich. I think I even put some Vienna in there. I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to have a look. Um, and then, yeah. So if you're, if you're watching me on YouTube, that, that pile of grain, that's by me. That's all that's what's going inside my beer. So I'll probably be starting that a little bit later today. It's, it's, it's Sunday. It's, you know, it's Sunday. What, what, what can you do? Right. Um, and um, yeah. So what I find the big differences between Imperial beer, Imperial Stout and a, and a Baltic Porter uh predominantly i find it's mouthfeel and also flavor i find porters are a lot more roasted flavor forward and uh like you get that nice kind of rich dark uh kind of dark chocolate and also the uh roasted coffee flavors that predominantly they're a little bit more assertive than you would with a stout now with stouts i find that they are very much more subdued. They're much more mellow, much more creamy feeling. And the notes are a lot gentler, shall we say. They're not as assertive. Now, mind you, a lot of people don't have the same kind of flavor profiles or the not flavor profiles, preferences as most. I know I like my stouts to be uh, com sometimes complex, a little bit more well balanced between chocolate and coffee flavors. Maybe, and then my porters, I really do enjoy them being robust, uh, being full on that roasted coffee flavor. I think I got coffee on the brain because I don't know how many times I've said that today. Um, and I think a lot of things, um, People have a hard time with uh, things that are not necessarily not necessarily what uh, they expect. I'm sorry, guys. I got distracted. Shiny object syndrome for here, this kid here. Um, no. I'm going to read a little bit of history. Maybe that'll help us out here a little bit. So, so what I hear, Baltic porters are produced in a wide variety uh, of Baltic states. For example, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Czech Republic, Germany, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, Denmark, Sweden, and the United States. Don't forget, just say North America because we make it here in Canada too. Uh, Baltic porter is especially of many Polish breweries with countries with the country's oldest being uh, in uh, a certain area. I'm not going to be able to say in the name. I will put it up underneath here uh, so you'll see it in 1881. Fin uh, there's another brewery in Finland. I am not going to try and say it because I don't want to insult anybody. Uh, there's a brewery in Finland that has been brewing Baltic porters in Helsinki since the 1860s. While, while in Estonia, there's a newcomer specializing in barrel-aged porters. Uh, in Denmark, there's a world porter. Uh, the word porter is synonymous with imperial stouts. And a Wybro's Baltic porter, now brewed at by Carlsberg, is known by both names. Porter and uh, a porter was brewed in Germany in 1853 uh, until 1990, when production ceased in East uh, East Germany after unification. Uh, in 1998, uh, a brewery uh, um, resumed production of an old recipe. Uh, it was followed by another brewer by other brewers such as uh the newelser okay again i'm not going to try and say this as much as i would love to be able to say these names i can't but i will put them underneath so you have an idea of what i'm talking about uh brewed in eight percent uh baltic porter so even in poland there is an as actually a baltic porter day so yeah I find myself rambling here a little bit, guys. I'm, I'm really sorry, but it's one of those things that it's, it's hard not to want to talk about when you're, uh, when, when you really do enjoy the style, you've been trying to learn as much as you can and you're trying to get out what you know. And it's, it's, a, it's a big mess in my head right now, trying to get out what I know, but 
hopefully that covers everything in a roundabout way. So today is also going to be brew day. So I'm actually going to try and uh, get a brew day in later this afternoon. And I am going to be making my Baltic Porter. And then hopefully from that, I'm going to put it into a bourbon barrel and let it chill out for a little while. So we'll see what happens. Um, if you want to know more about these styles of beers, uh, check out, uh, what is it? Designing uh, Great Res- great Beers by Ray Daniels. Look at uh, the Oxford's B- uh, Bible for Beer by Garrett Oliver. Uh, then there's the Beer Bible. And oh, and there's also, what's the other book? There's another, and, the, and there's a book, I think it's called Taste by uh, Randy Mosier, which is also very informative on this beer. So if there's anything else you guys want to know about this beer, go check it out. Check those books out. Lots of information on the internet. And also check out Brewer's Friend and there'll be a wide variety of things there that people will be able to tell you about this beer as well. So guys, thank you very much for coming along for the ride and a beer or two along the way. I'm Dan and uh, stay tuned because we're going to have some more guests coming back very, very soon. Cheers and I'll see you on their side. Thank you.